Good morning, everybody. Uh, yep, I'm Elliot, and when you hear some of what I say, you, it's your decision, your opinion about how daring um, we've been. But as, as the questions go on in the panel, you'll hear a bit more about what we do, but I'm trying to stick to the script kind of that I was given, which I find always impossible. So, uh, but I'll give it a whirl. So this is a, a uh, sign that's a real sign in, in the middle of uh, Australia, taken by a friend of uh, the schools that we have there. His name is Mark Thompson. Um, he's quite a character, and uh, most of his real-world learning takes place in uh, sheds in Ireland, uh, where uh, people have, for generations, uh, made, broken, and fixed things. And he's quite the character, and he's quite a photographer as well. He sent me this, and it says, uh, as you can see, we are here, we are here, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it is now, and uh, the rest is guesswork. Uh, and uh, he sent that to me for a very good reason, uh, because we live in a world that's highly unpredictable, uh, with a lot of ambiguity and a lot of uncertainty, and our students and young people and all of us thrive on that. And yet, in schools, it's all for certain. We know where we're going to go next. Turn the page curriculums. Rote learning, sitting in your seat, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Of course students are disengaged. That's not who we are as a race. And so this is a big deal. Um, the work also that we've done is work through practice. So there's a famous baseball player in the United States, former Yogi Berra. And uh, he has a, a beautiful statement, because he's known for mixing up his words. And in education, I'm kind of known for mixing up my words as well. And he said, uh, in theory, theory and practice are the same. But in practice, they're different. So if you think about that a little bit, uh, you'll get the point. You have to be a practitioner. You have to be on the ground. The work emerges. And there's a famous guy, Charles Lindblom. He's 100 years old. He's at Yale at 96 years old, and he was the guy who wrote about muddling. That was his economic theory. And his last paper was still muddling, not yet through. And he equated doing the work as a work on a potter at a wheel, that you have to feel your way through it. It's not just about the data from the outside. It's that you have to have a sense and a feel for what you're doing. So that's what we do. And as you do it, the work emerges, and the pot gets to a place where you say, it's done now. And then you make another one, and the same thing happens. So that's a really important statement uh, for me. So this is an interesting little piece that I saw in The New Yorker uh, when it used to come as paper to my house. And I called up my buddy Frank Wilson, who's a very famous neurologist who was at Stanford. Uh, he's retired now. And he wrote a book called The Hand. And uh, his uh, story is, uh, you can't talk about uh, human intelligence without talking about language and the hand combined. And yet, we've cut the hand off in schools. The hand informs the mind just as much as the mind informs the hand. And when we looked at that, he called me almost at the same time because he got his New Yorker magazine delivered about the same time. He said, did you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I said, yeah, that's, kind of, that's amazing. So I called up the guy who illustrated it. Because I was like, well, what's going on here? Did you know what you were drawing? He says, yeah, I think I knew what I was drawing. I said, well, tell me. And he was exactly on the money with Frank and I. So obviously, this is a mom with her baby in a relationship doing the same things. So in neurology, so, uh, Frank would say, that's dopamine and oxytocin working together. All right? That's neurotransmitters going, I want a relationship with you, and I want to get better at the things I want to get better at. And that's what we formed our schools around, relationships and the things that you want to get better at. And as you go deep, you learn many things. That's not what Elliot said. Van Gogh said that. And we do the, just the opposite in schools, mile wide, inch deep. 
in most cases. So that's a, port, and a very, very important little illustration that says a lot about who we are. So I'm going to have you watch this for a second. <laughs> show you my granddaughter. Oh, no, it's not my granddaughter. It's not my granddaughter. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not my granddaughter. But that's really, really powerful. What do we, every young person is like that. And parents who get connected through that bonding and through what they want to get better at, that's powerful. That's occurring in a church. That young child, like all young children, is going to go to school. What do we do with that? Put them in a seat and tell them to sit still? That's crazy. What do we do with it? So that's a long conversation we could all have about just that one 30 second clip right there. Now, my buddy just sent me this two days ago, three days ago, right before I left from California. He's a, a craftsman and, a, and a, a carpenter and, and an incredible artist who does work in our house. This is his grandson and this is his other uh, grandfather. This happens all the time. There's that dopamine and oxytocin working together or being with somebody, not doing something to somebody. With is a powerful word in big picture. Being with students. They're at the center and they take the lead and they go to their edges. And as Jane Jacobs said, you have to take, go to the edge with somebody and declare it your center. And that's how things change. That's the innovative piece. Real, real simple. That kind of intensity is around not just I want to learn how to do that, but I want a relationship with you. And when we get that with our children in and outside of schools, that's where the learning is very, very powerful. So this is another illustration. Somebody who's a friend of mine in New Orleans, we just won an XQ prize in New Orleans, and they gave us $10 million, God knows why. Um, to build a, uh, a brand new school that's a big picture school. No, it's a, a really good school. Huh? And it's called New Harmony High, and it's about uh, what are the new harmonies? What's the new work? What's the new art? What's the new music? What's the new food? What's the new way to live dealing with climate change in a city that's basically underwater and below sea level? So this is her grandson. She says, Ellie, take a look at this. This is my grandson's art. I said, wow. He's five years old. Look at the intensity of that drawing. Circles within circles within circles within circles. There's a lot of patterning there. That's math. That's mathematics. But I know Bobby. Bobby, grandma, is an architect. Daddy is an architect. When the young child shows that to his dad and his grandma, those are those neurotransmitters in operation. We don't have to call them neurotransmitters. We don't need the science to tell us that, but we like to be informed about it because it helps us think about learning. Like Project Zero said at Harvard. You know what Project Zero is? Know why they call it Project Zero? Because we know zero about learning. We think we know a lot. We don't. There's so much more to know. So much more to know. So here's something that is about the outside. Now, there's Autobahns, there's Da Vinci's, there's Darwin's, there's Alicia Keys, there's Bob Dylan, there's Ramanujan. All of those are their notebooks. And there's two of our students' notebooks there as well, because they didn't know that they were going to become famous, none of those people. Not one. And yet, all those notebooks are glass encased in museums where you can't touch them. 
When you go into industry, and these are for the uh, entrepreneur innovation folks in the audience, may not be educators, PowerPoints don't go into a law when there's a litigation around intellectual property. Research papers don't go in. You can check it out because I've worked with the industries around us. What goes in? Somebody's notebook. How much credit do we give students' notebooks in school about what they're writing about? What's the power in that? We're starting to do that because we're starting to talk to industry about what is important. It ain't a PowerPoint or a research paper that are the most important. How much time do we spend on that? They're always in their notebooks writing down stuff that matters to them. Mattering is a big word. Muddling is a big word. I'm going to give you the three M's. Mattering is a big word. And mingling is a big word. Mingling with, mattering to, and muddling through. Those are all important pieces around how to develop cross-sectional relationships in and outside of school. Famous Bruegel painting, The Plowman or The Fall of Icarus. What's interesting here, and this is a long time ago, they, everybody knows this, every culture, it's cross-cultural. Doesn't matter where you are, what timing it is in history. There's Icarus falling into the drink. He wanted to fly, he got too close to the sun. Every adult in that picture has their heads turned away from Icarus, is not paying attention to what he's doing. That was the message of the plowman in the fall of Icarus that Bruegel painted. That influences our schools. Every one of our schools, our students have an advisor in the school, connected to a mentor outside the school, where two days a week our students are outside of school, around their interests, developing relationships with people that they want to have a relationship or what are, uh, around what they are interested in. It was the warning right there. Did we pay attention is the question. So I was involved in a study by the federal government in the, in the U.S. Department of Education. They called me and another guy up and they said, we want to study disengagement. And this is that, what we were talking about earlier, decision-based evidence making. We think evidence-based decision, uh, uh, evidence evidence decisions are the gold standard. Little do we know that we make decisions around the evidence and it's very, very subjective. So they said, Elliot, life events, behavior, academic failure, and disinterest. That's why kids leave school and get disinterested in it. I said, wait a second, there's a heck of a lot more research than that. And at any given time of any given student in their life cycle of when they're in a school, any one or any combination of those things can disengage them. Any day of the week, any month, or for years, if nobody is paying attention to who's in front of them. Mattering. What matters to the student is the school paying attention to the community. Fitting, the student has elected to go to the school. The parents send them to the school. They're trying to fit the school. Does the school fit them? Their interests, their talents, how they feel every day, what's going on in their lives. Unrecognized talents and interests. Benjamin Bloom did a study. What did he find out? He studied people who were famous at what they did mathematicians, swimmers, ballet dancers, engineers. Here's what he found. A child had a little talent outside of a school. They belonged to an organization. The organization said, your kid is great to the parents, doing pretty well. Child, do you like it? Yep, I like what I'm doing here. I like sailing boats. Parents say, you want to sail boats? Child says, yes. Organization, everybody continues along the way. Next step, organization says, knock, knock. This child is really, really good and too good for this organization. They need a technique mentor. Do you want one? Yeah. Parents, do you want your child to pursue that? Yeah. The rest is history. That's how we get, that's how talent is developed. Lauren Sosniak did a follow-up study. Both of them passed away, unfortunately. And what did she find out? She found out that there's a near zero correlation to developing talent of young people that schools pay attention to. They're all about the content that's in front of them, granting diplomas around the content, seat time and giving out grades. So unrecognized talents, restrictions. A professor, his name escapes me right now, did a study on how restrictive school environments are to children. What he found out was they're more restrictive than a being a Marine Corps recruit or being a convicted felon in a prison. You can't even get out of your seat to go to the bathroom. You can't talk. 
you can't move, you can't use your hands, you can't weave or braid or do, you know, you just got to pretend like you're right on the money and some of you may like being here and some of you may not, I can't tell, but you're here and it's a lecture and normally that's not the best way to do things, but if you want to learn from a lecture and you made a decision personally to be here and used your agency to do it, that's pretty cool. Most of the time that's not happening in schools though. So uh, restrictions, when we talk about the government and cross-sectional relationships that we need, schools need to loosen their restrictions, allow students to learn outside of school and manage that learning. They need to have more time for exercise. They need to have time to eat well. When people talk about gold standard evidence base on performance, sugar, fat, salt in heavy quantities in school affect performance. They affect performance of all of us. They also lead to diabetes, as was talked about in the opening session, heart disease, cancer. Don't think, think about happiness. You're not happy if you're sick. Even if you have a college degree and multiple degrees, you got to take care of your health. What role is school taking care of, taking a part in that? Let alone the arts, which Ada talks about a lot. We had just a little brief conversation about it. Mathematician, you can't find a mathematician, a great mathematician or scientist who's not a wonderful artist. And they had to make a decision whether they were going to be an artist or a musician, a mathematician, a scientist, or an engineer. This is crazy what we do. The rhythms of that young girl are math, those patterns. The drumming of, of a tabla, patterns, mathematics. That's how Manjul, who won the Fields Medal at Princeton, his mom took him out of school, sent him back to Punjab, where he learned tabla from his uncle, Sanskrit poetry from his grandfather. The rhythms of the arts produce the math. We don't get it in our schools. So those are really important things. I'll say a few more things. I don't know how much time I got up there. You give me two, three minutes and I can stop whenever. So this is a famous vaudeville skit. Abbott and Costello, you may or may not know it, I don't, but it's very famous in the United States. And it's called Who's On First? And it's a play with words kind of like what I do all the time. So a woman, Julia Freeland Fisher, a researcher, just wrote a book called Who You Know? And we're in the book, and I've had multiple conversations with her. And I said, Julia, it's a great book. It's beyond just who you know. Schools only grant diplomas and certifications on a what. What and who need to be merged and married? What and who happen out in the real world? That's how we got an edge with our schools, because we knew that who knows you know what you know and who you learn from on the outside one-on-one -on -one, in serious situations to develop skill sets and mindsets about the things that you're interested gives you very, very deep and clear understandings of things that start to get you on the road to not just taking in information and spitting it back, but actually getting to understandings and wisdom. That happens on the outside. It doesn't happen just from a book. We have a friend named Reed Hastings who's a mathematician and a philosopher, one of the top, sh top chefs in Chicago. And he says, I can read five books on any subject and know what 95% of the world knows about it. But to know what that other 5% that the world knows about that subject is going to take me the rest of my life. And we don't think about that in schools at all. So who knows you know what you know matters. That's why we get our students out two days a week. And we have pretty incredible results around all the traditional measures and all the measures that we use around our students' lives. Students at the center, people talk about that a lot. But if you have a batch processing system that's all about standards and standardization, students can't declare their center at their edge. You have to be with them and follow them out. So students at the center could be made meaningless if the restrictions of school prohibit them from being who they are and who they want to show you. That's a book out there. I have a few copies for people who just want to pick them up at the end. Um, just give them to you. It's about leaving to learn. We leave to learn and then come back. We created a school and a set of schools and not more than that, some notions about programming that any school can use. 
because that's where the learning is. Schools get all the credit and all the blame, but it doesn't happen out there. Parents, mentors, organizations, churches, that's where students are learning. And we have to credit it where it happens, because learning happens 24-7. That's our, um, the guy who did the I Love New York logo. Oh, we went back. My wife is telling me, she's uh, coaching me out there. I can pay attention. Thank you. So, um, so this is our, uh, <laughs> yep, uh, there you go. You got an applause there. That's good. So this is, um, what's the guy's name? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, so this is um, the guy who did the I Love New York logo. He found us and he made this thing. I think it looks like a bottle cap, but it, it, anyhow, I think his last design thing was a bottle cap, but it kind of says what we're about. Mentors, students in an advisory system, parents, that green thing is chopped off a little bit, but each student goes into that center. And that's what's important. That's how you center and get students out on their edge when they're outside of school and the discussion happens. That's our, our lowest common denominator of our schools is each and every student. We're one student at a time in a community of learners and we organize schools around that for the same cost, per, cost that schools get in any place around the world so far. So I just want to say one thing about one of these pieces here. This is some of our guides that we use to help support the work. But when you take a look at the role of a teacher, arguably people will say one of the things that we did was we changed the role of a teacher to the role of an advisor. What's the difference? Very simple. Teachers are most of the time instructing and talking to somebody. Advisors are listening and finding out from students. What do you like to do? What do you like to do when you were three years old? What are your interests? Who are the people that you hang out with? What do your parents think about what you're doing? I don't know the answers to those questions. I have to listen. That's giving me information and an understanding of who, who each and every child is. That's why we have a learning plan at each and every one of our schools. So we start out with these expectations that we think students have of schools, and we could talk about that more. We took those expectations, and we developed programming from that. These are stu things that students want of us. Time to do things, practice, authenticity, those are some of them, and the timing. All of those programs at the top are the new structures of our big picture schools and arguably other schools are doing it. We, we, don't, we don't do big picture schools to do big picture schools. We do big picture schools to influence the system. This is some of our results. Same data as what schools use, also different data. Healthy relationships we measure. Adult self-fulfillment. Meaningful work. We did a longitudinal study of our students 15 years out in all of our schools. That's what we're interested in. One of the things that we found out is that about 72% of our students had work after they graduated college two and four years in the internships that they had while they were in high school. That means something to every city, especially a city like Hong Kong probably, who loses a lot of students to brain drain. They leave because they don't think there's anything there for them when actually there is. So this is us. These are some of our students. I'll talk about Jennifer for a second. Uh, Jennifer, that's, she's 16 years old. She's in the prenatal care unit, high-risk pregnancies of Rhode Island Hospital. This is what happens. Most of the nursing students think she's a nurse there. She's not. She's a student, a high school student. She watched two women come in, high-risk pregnancies. One had insurance, one didn't. They received different care. She said, that's not fair. Okay, her advisor and, and her, with her, said, do a project. Project was around insurance rates, who gets different care because they have insurance, uninsured versus insured. She presented to the hospital board, they changed their policies. Really powerful stuff. That's what our students do. This is another one of our students. He was a bike technician when he started out. That he just reached, that's the governor of Rhode Island right there in the blue, light blue. That's the mayor right next to the governor of Providence. He won a $400,000 grant to change the park system in Providence around bike trails. And he was the one who designed it. This is another one of our students who works in the water systems and developed a tool that cost $10,000 and he made it for $700. This is another one of our students 
who had verbal apraxia or has verbal apraxia, when she came into her school, that means kind of like you can't talk. When she came into her school, she couldn't shut up. All right, it was a small environment. She felt comfortable. All of a sudden, she starts talking. Um, she was interested in drone technology. She's got a full scholarship, uh, Gates Scholar, from, to uh, Laterno College in uh, Texas. These are, this is our school in New Orleans. This is a project that just came into the school. This is only ninth graders. The school just started out. This young artist said, I'm going to build a canoe and people put people's stories on it. They're going to write their stories about Katrina. And it's all going to be a paper canoe and it's going to work. Her, his dad came in, who's a surgeon, and there he is in his scrubs coming in to help out. And this is the beginning of how we start our schools to bring the inside, the outside in and the inside out. There's our students. They're working side by side with the artist. When that's done, their narratives are going to be on that canoe. Anybody who writes their narrative onto that canoe or draws an image gets to use that canoe. That's going to be a canoe that's not glass encased. It's going to be on the outside. So this is Jada. Jada works at the Botanical Gardens. She works in almost all of our schools now across the country around making plant-based diets in our schools, healthy foods for our students. And that's her mentor, Robin, who is one of the heads of the Botanical Gardens in Providence. This is Johnny. Uh, Johnny I know real well. Johnny started out, once again, as a bike technician. But when you probe and you know the student, it's not about the bikes. It's about helping people. I wanted to help people who wanted to get their bikes fixed. When he got over the bike stuff, and he did, because it's around developing interests, not one interest, and uh, staying with him on his journey, he became an EMT in the community. That's what he wanted to do. And he'll probably become a registered nurse. This is Ian, he's a fisherman. He probably makes more money than any one of our graduates ever. When he was in our school, um, the Coast Guard employed and quotes him at his internship because he knew more about the shoreline than they did. And he helped map the shoreline of Narragansett Bay. This is Natalie, she's with the mayor in Providence, kind of like his chief of staff, high school students. Boy, do we underestimate students and their abilities and the things that they can do. Uh, this is a young student at one of our new schools, a ninth grader, uh, developing a prosthetic device. So um, I'll stop there. And uh, thanks very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation we're going to have and uh, more to come. Thank you very much. Oh, I just want to mention, and all of those things involve collaborations with people outside of the school that students generate. We didn't generate them. They emerged through the students' interests. Okay.